thank you again, everyone, for uh, joining in. I think uh, we could get this uh, party started for our uh, Wednesday webinars. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, my name is Devin Tani. I'm the marketing and education coordinator here at White Labs. I recently just moved to the marketing department. I was uh, I've been with White Labs for seven years. I've jumped from R and D to working in the analytical lab, so I have a bunch of um, QA, QC experience, and that's why I thought it would be a perfect topic to start with. Um, and then the person we're interviewing today is my good friend, uh, Peter Cronin from L. Smith. Peter, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Howdy, guys. My name is Peter Cronin. Uh, I'm the quality manager here at Ailsmith Smith Brewing Company. Uh, I've also been here about seven years, a little over seven years. Um, so I got to see uh, the move from our old location. It was two blocks away from here, uh, where currently McKellar San Diego is. Um, and we were making around 12,000 barrels a year there to now, where last year we, we were just shy of 46,000 barrels. So lots, lots of growth, growth during that time period and growth in the quality lab. So excited to, to talk about it today. Yeah, because uh, Peter, right, um, when you first started, um, you were probably the start of the QAQC program for L Smith, that's correct? Yeah, I, I was directly hired out of the, the UCSD program. So I, I did that for two years, the uh, brewing certificate program. So you kind of get all the, the theoretical knowledge. Um, and that was the first job I applied to, was a quality tech position at Ailsmith, Smith. And I was tasked with starting a quality lab. So um, basically saw it from microscope, <laughs> It was microscope and a spec were the only two things they had. And then now there's a whole quality lab behind me, which is pretty awesome. All your bunch of toys and instruments. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'm about to share my screen. But yeah, we could start with, uh, again, uh, the importance of like building a quality lab and why uh, just being from our side of why we think um, it really helps uh, save on um, your beer brand and what, what's really important with that uh, QA, QC, QC system. So, um, he, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's for us, we're, we're a production brewery. So uh, we do have a lot of brands that are year round. Um, we certainly do one-offs as well. Um, but the, the main beer we produce, uh, a San Diego style pale ale um, called 394, it's about 60% of our production. So um, producing a beer at that size, uh, it's all the inputs are kind of changing from batch to batch. So how do you create the same beer uh, from, from batch to batch, from year to year? And then some of our, that goes all the way to seasonal. So something that's not year round, say like our Oktoberfest, um, every year you're gonna have a new malt lot, new hop lot, uh, but you still wanna create the same beer. So even if you're not creating year round beers, likely even if you're a brew pub size, you're still gonna have some like crowd favorites that are those, those seasonals, uh, a Meritzen or, or a Springbok or a, a summer double IPA or something. And you want that to be consistent. Yeah, speaking with those, uh initial input uh, variables like your raw materials, what are some of those like metrics that you uh, look for to also maintain that consistency or like how do you uh, play around with those variables to get the same product that the customer can't see, like can't tell the difference? Sure, so I definitely lean on the manufacturer's uh, malt COAs, the certificates of analysis that, that they give us. Um, malt analysis has extract and friability, um, it's changing a lot right now. Uh, Brewers Association, the new brewer magazine came out with like the big front page article about, about how malt's gonna be really tough this year. And we're already starting to see that. Um, protein levels are going crazy. Um, extract is, is doing all right. It's going down a little bit. Um, but some of the malt tests in-house we do is mostly sensory. Um, so we, we love that malty sensory method um, and we've had supply chain issues in the last two years. So we've had to kind of try and find some alternatives from some other brands, um, especially because we use a lot of uh, European malts, uh, British, Belgian, and German malts. Um, so 
trying to flavor match. And sometimes you're not matching one malt with one, you're matching a blend of two malts with one. Um, but that malt tea sensory method is fantastic. Um, and same for hop teas. Um, hop, hops from year to year, from lot to lot, from farm to farm, all change. Um, so I, I love those two sensory methods, hop teas and malt teas. Those two sensory methods, those are on uh, ASBC, the American Society of Brewing Chemists, that's correct? They, they're up there and they're fairly new, which is pretty cool. Like I got to see the first presentation, like poster presentations at some of those ASBC conferences, which now I use them in my lab all the time. Yeah, like they're, they're always coming with, out with new stuff. Um, I believe they just had like a yeast counting video, but um, any, any um, the American Society of Brewing Chemists as well as the MBA always have like very robust and up-to-date methods that um, are a great place to learn and start, uh, start from because uh, they've, they've done the science to make sure those methods work uh, throughout different breweries, throughout uh, different regions. Yeah, definitely. Hi, but yeah, uh, going off off of the raw materials, um, I say let's talk about um, some of those metrics for um, during fermentation. Like, oh, uh, where where are some good places to start? Right, we get those certificate analysis from our raw material providers. It's a great starting point of writing down certain parameters, certain key, key flags that we want to hit. But like, what about fermentation side? Uh, what, what stuff are you monitoring coming off, coming off either the hot side or even the cold side? So a lot of that, I'm still only one person uh, in this quality department. So um, there's a great book. I have it on my desk, like right down here. Uh, it's called Quality Management by uh, Mary Pelletieri. And she's, she constantly says like, hey, Quality departments of breweries are small, so you have to have quality out on the floor. So uh, a lot of our seller people and brewers do those metrics out there, and that's pH and Plato are, are the main two. Um, hot side all the way through, um, and then cold side every day, there's a gravity check is what we call it, and that's pH and Plato. Um, if it's a kettle sour beer, I'll bring in some lactic acid titration just to make sure we get, get that titration acidity right. Um, and then we're doing a lot of experiments right now. So we're changing DO. So we have a DO meter that's, that we're working with. Um, we're really trying to hone in on our tannin and the ASBC polyphenol method is pretty easy. Um, so lots of different things coming in, but definitely pH and Plato every day and on every tank. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. Just monitoring that, uh, I call them the daily fermentation kinetics, your, uh, your exactly. gravity drop and your pH drop. Um, those are easy, quick ways and pretty inexpensive to um, really track down uh, when a problem arises before it arises, right? Like just seeing that pH drop within that 40 hours, if, if it's not hitting that same timeline, it's like, oh, something's wrong with, with the fermentation, at least you could remedy it then before being too late and adding oxygen and like uh, ruining your beer. At the earlier you catch something by just monitoring pH and gravity, the easier it is to remedy a problem. Exactly, if there's, um, we've had some pretty rare instances in the past where say uh, a malt lot comes in with a ton of beta glucan that led to a not so fun louder hot side and um, we met our gravity, but maybe the, the carbohydrate level was a little different. Um, so, so the fermentation looks different, that curve looks different um, and we could help it out. We could pitch more yeast, we could aerate second day, we can do all these things and react so that we still get to the same beer with the ABV that's on that bottle or on that, um, that can. Um, so it, it, all this data just helps you react um, and make sure that your, your customers are getting the best product. Going off that like carbohydrates and all that, Peter, are you doing any like forced fermentations to know what your final gravities are or? Um... If we're using a, a, new, um, a new malt, like a, especially if it's a base malt, I'll do a forced fermentation. Um, and there's kind of two methods like Hey, is the yeast okay method? Like, is it going to ferment all those carbohydrates? Um, 
or or it's looking at the malt and looking at your mash method. Um, so uh, sometimes I'll take off the during knockout. I'll take a little off pit way over pitch the yeast and see what it ends at. That's more looking at the hot side. Um, but that same day after pitch, maybe a few hours after pitch, I'll grab off the fermenter, won't add any yeast, and I'll force ferment that. And that'll kind of tell me, hey, is the yeast actually going to ferment this all the way out? Oh, nice. Yeah. So you do like a real time plus like a over pitch method. Yeah. Yes. Uh, for yeah, us, yeah. We, we do the over pitch method. Um, if you look on the slide, yeah, it's pretty much uh, almost like making a prop starter, but you're adding a bunch more yeast and it's seen uh, um, with that yeast strain and all your fermentables of how, how low that final gravity actually is. But, oh, I'm, we might start implementing um, that real time too. Does, nice. uh, does the timeline, uh, is it still a bit quicker on the lab skill than on It's your... definitely still quicker because I still put it in my, my shaking incubator. So it's at a higher temperature. Uh, and then with that, that motion, um, just possibly getting a little more aerated. Um, so it isn't, it isn't perfect, but uh, it has allowed us to figure out if something's going to ferment out all the way or not and react before that. Nice. Um, going off of those, like uh, if it's going to ferment all the way out, like um, what are, what is your like action course? Like uh, if it doesn't, or um, do you start looking at like yeast, yeast viabilities or like how, how is that um, come into play? So certainly if we, if we have a slow fermentation, um, especially if it's high gravity, we'll aerate uh, the next day or 48 hours after. Um, big high gravity beers don't mind that aeration as much. Uh, we won't do that for any low gravity or hoppy beers. Um, and then croissoning has been kind of what we've been led to, especially with hop creep. Um, cleaning up beers with just a, honestly, for 255 barrels, it's just like a, a half barrel of, of good fermenting beer from another tank. You add that in and it cleans it right up. Um, it could also, like, we, we have a, a pilot beer in the tank now, and it's just slow, like dropping 0.3 Play-Doh every day. So sometimes you just get, have to give it time and move your, we do have to move your production schedule. Um, there's nothing you can do other than that, but it, it'll get there. <laughs> For the slow attenuating ones, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, speaking of like DO, like you were saying DO for the high gravities um, and you have a DO meter, um, do you use that both on the um, finished product side as well as the inline for uh, pitching or do you have like two different DO meters? So we have two different ones. Uh, we used to use a singular one. Um, the, so we have a C box uh, and an orbisphere on the, the finished end. Those tend to do more uh, PPB range. Um, and then we have a Hawk DO meter for the parts per million range. Um, once we got that, we were able to validate that our current aeration um, works on our production system. But on our pilot system, it's kind of hooking up a bunch of tanks and then like a little yeah. flow meter that's manual. <laughs> so that was a little harder to validate. You have the little ball like floating. Um, so it was, it was nice to have that little DO meter there, which the, the higher range DO meters are much less expensive uh, than a C box, Anton Parr C box or a, a Hawk Orbisphere. Um, and aeration is pretty key to getting a good fermentation. Yeah, I totally agree. I was like, just those uh, the inlines of like, although you have the ball, it's what's what uh, oxygen you're adding in doesn't always get into solution. So having that DO meter really, exactly. really helps. If you add a sight glass, you can see the bubbles going by and you know, well, that obviously didn't get into solution. So how, how much is getting in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, for fermentations, we always recommend that like eight to 10 PPMs. Um, that just really helps yeast uh, for that lag phase. They're going to uptake that, uptake that oxygen and build like healthy cell walls. So that way they could uh, pass through those pH and eat up those sugars in, in and out those cell walls. Um, what happens if you have 
bad oxygenation is um, those cell walls become thick and then um, those like metabolites, so your acetaldehyde or your diastol at the end when fermentation is done, they can't really go back into the yeast cell to change into something else because the, the cell walls aren't uh, well formed. They're, they're almost like a concrete wall. So then yeah. that's what, yeah. <laughs> we, I, have, I have a little anecdote on this. Hopefully it's quick. <laughs> um, we had uh, nut brown. It's our uh, kind of English style brown ale. Um, Five percent, so should never have issues attenuating that beer. Um, immediately, second day of fermentation, something was going wrong. Didn't know exactly what. Um, kind of a cellar person who did the gravity check flagged it because it was so far off. Um, and I just started investigating it. And one of our brewers is like, "Oh yeah, when I I came up to do the second knockout, it looked like the O2 tank." Had, had gone out. So probably during the first knockout, it had gone out maybe a minute in, because they always check it, but maybe a minute in an aeration, like all of a sudden it goes out. Um, and we had three three batches, batches of that beer that day, but just because the first knockout was affected, the yeast growth phase is different and everything. Um, so we, have, we bought a little like, I think it was like a $200 alarm that just hooks right up to uh, your aeration nozzle on your tank. And if it detects a low pressure, it'll sound out. Um, and it, we haven't had one since. And it's definitely a cheap way of saving a lot of beer. Yeah, at, at least there was that uh, remedy for after exactly. that stalled fermentation happened. Oh man. Uh, yeah, it's sometimes the smallest things of like finding what, what the variable is of what caused the stalled fermentation or um, Again, trying to trying to troubleshoot, right? That's the whole point of that QAQC is trying to troubleshoot totally. and make sure the problem doesn't happen again. <laughs> exactly. Speaking of yeast, um, did you want to talk about how uh, how many strains you guys currently use, or um, like uh, how you guys uh, cell count? I know you guys have a salometer. Is that correct? Sure. So we do have an automated cell counter now, but I did not start with one um, for the first three years here. I was manually uh, doing it on a hemocytometer with a microscope. The microscope, I believe, was, was from the 80s. <laughs> so you, you don't need a fancy microscope. Um, and the, I just bought my, my stain from you guys at White Labs. It helps that you're only a few blocks away. Um, <laughs> uh, so super simple. And I remember like a few weeks in uh, of me being at Alesmith and doing cell counts are uh, my boss, the director um, of production was like, oh man, our, I know where our beers are gonna be every day with Plato and pH. I know where they're gonna be. I've never had that happen before. And now you know immediately when they're off. Um, so your brain starts creating this like little range of, oh, okay, 48 hours in, usually this beer is this range. Um, so it just creates way more consistency in the beer itself, but then allows you that reaction time to do something if, if there is an issue. Um, so now I do have a salometer. Um, I'm not the only one doing cell counts now. Um, say I'm on vacation or uh, yesterday I trained two of our brewers because we're possibly considering doing some weekend brews. We still only brew Monday through Friday. Um, and if they're gonna be here on the weekend, then they're gonna to need to do the cell count. Um, as for strains in-house, we actually have more strains than I've, I've ever had. <laughs> I think we have six. Um, Alesmith does do some contract brewing and with those contract brews, they bring in some of their own yeast. So, and we're, we're propagating that yeast in our, on our pilot system, we're keeping it going. Um, when we harvest it, we're keeping it in our cold box for the next contract beer. So we're not bringing it offsite or anything. We're like kind of doing all of our normal yeast stuff, but with their yeast too. Um, so we have uh, a, a regular like clean ale strain, um, a hazy strain, a two, two lager strains right now, which we're, we're ale smith, but we do some good lagers. Um, one of those is contract. Uh, and then we do some contract uh, hard tea and hard seltzer both of which are separate, separate strains. So it's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot to manage. 
yeah um has but i think your story of um when you first started and the whole sell kind of like making sure you're pitching at the same rate so you know like it really helps with that how we we're talking about that fermentation connects your timeline of like that's really easy to flag because you're keeping the variable of the pitch rate how many how many yeast cells you're pitching in the same and then exactly. um do you ever see like uh does your cell counting with the viability also like give you a clue of like all right i'm not going to use this generation anymore or um how, I'll definitely how do you guys see the salometers helped with um so we have a for that main like clean ale strain american ale strain uh we use a, a yeast brink for that that agitates it um every few minutes it'll just kind of fluff it up again keep it homogenized um the salometer actually i think i did all these studies on the hemocytometer back in the day um i was able to figure out how long it takes so it's about 20 minutes of agitation until it's like nicely homogenized and then how long it could last in the brink i would do a test every day and it's about seven days um, it would go down about half a percent viability every day and then seven days in i'm like okay we're we're getting starting to get below 90. I know that that affects, I've had plenty of beers in the past where like, oh, that affects fermentation. I know for a fact. Um, and then, I mean, there've been times when all of a sudden the strain, someone, oh, this, this happened once, but the brink wasn't chilled. They forgot to chill it. And the yeast was in there overnight warm, uh, getting agitated. Uh, so the next day, I go in, I do a cell count and it's 70% viable. It's like, okay, we need to, we need to order another strain. So, but if I didn't know that, I would have put that into a beer. I wouldn't have ordered another pitchable. Um, so it's, it's powerful. Cell counting is powerful. Viability stains are powerful. Um, but I, I still kind of make my decision on how many generations just from, from fermentation. Viability doesn't change too much. Um, there's actually a good about four to 10 generations in for American ale strain is when it like rips through a beer. I do see a little slowing, um, but we go all the way to 15 generations with that. Um, during COVID, we pushed it a little longer just because <laughs> things happen. Uh, but now we're back to like 13 to 15 generations for that. Uh, about eight for our hazy and our logic strains as well. Nice. Yeah. Um that's great like going that uh many generations shows like really good qaqc really good sops in place uh to really Definitely. make those easterns last that long like oh with the yeast sprink of just agitating and doing it hot it's like oh those yeast cells are t eating up their glycogen reserves and starting to exactly. already do their thing so once they're actually tossing the beer they're gonna not not work out the way you want them no definitely not yeah what other, um, so going more on the cold side, um, we talked about DO, what about uh, like, so SOPs for like CIP and what sort of like checks do you have in place for um, contamination and, and all that? So currently the, the micro part, um, I, I do all of that. So I'll grab package samples and test um, out on the, um, on the cellar floor and on the packaging line, we do have an ATP meter. Um, that's just a little, it's a little swab. You put it in this reagent. Um, we actually have that exact model from Hygiena um, in the picture. Uh, and you have all your plan sites on there, which is an amazing amount of data. Um, and every month I'll, I'll gather the data from the ATP meter and figure out what, what's a hot spot in our brewery. Um, we've only ever had that once. It was a bottom valve on our fermenter 25511. Um, but throughout one year, every kind of spot in our brewery had maybe one, maybe two positives, like really bad positives. And that valve had nine. So throughout the whole year, multiple times, it came up like massively positive. We took that, we put it in a pressure cooker and, and autoclaved it, sterilized it, and didn't have an issue. But for how cheap an ATP meter is, it's a very, very powerful tool. 
Um, it's also really good because it's used in a lot of food industries, like food, sa food safety um, quality labs. It's, uh, it's really well accepted by the FDA. So if you have a good ATP program and you're kind of testing stuff, if you ever do have an issue, if you have a product pullback or a recall, you can say like, hey, these are the tests we did. We, we saw that it was clean. Um, and hopefully uh, they're like, okay, like your, your SOPs are good. Like we'll figure out how this happened. Um, that's, that's why I like it. Um, it's just very, very good reassurance. Yeah, I, I honestly love it too. It's like the easiest thing uh, for anyone to do um, just for the brewer after a CIP to check the tank, like maybe left side, right side, right right by the spray ball to make sure the CIP worked. If it didn't, then you could run another CIP cycle to make sure um, everything's dead. Pretty much um, that ATP mirror is just going to tell you, uh, right, adenine tri uh, phosphates are going to um, like the living source of life. So anything that's living will give you the RLU or relative light unit. Um, so ideally with a program, you want low RLUs for after a CIP to make sure there's nothing living in that area. But um, that's crazy how you're also using it for um, like environmental monitoring of like figure out where your hotspots are. That's a, yeah. another great thing is to swab, swab different places, swab everything. Yeah, it's, it's awesome to have like all those sites programmed into the hygiene meter. But it tells you where the, those hotspots are. Yeah, fantastic tool. Yeah, that, I, I feel like DOs and um, ATP mirrors are two of my favorite instruments to use and uh, easy to Agreed. use. Agreed. Agreed. Going to the more sciencey part, I know you have a, another fun instrument that you do for uh, micro contamination. If you, you want to talk about that, uh, sure. It's actually it's right behind my printer, right there. Um, so when I, uh, Alesmith didn't have a micro kind of arm of the quality department, uh, until 20, late 2017 was when I started looking around and, um, that's when that gene STA1 was kind of being found out with diastaticus. So, uh, we looked in, I, I have, uh, previous, uh, work experience using qPCR so I felt very comfortable working with real-time PCR um, and then what's cool is the companies have come out with better and better SOPs so I, I take a packaged beer um, all our beers unfiltered it's centrifuge but it's unfiltered so there's there's some solids in there I could spin that down grab any bacteria or yeast that's in there hopefully none um, and test that just break it down with the lys lysis buffer and test it on our RT-PCR machine. And it's in like half a day, I could have 96 samples ready to go telling me yes or no. Um, we have a huge barrel aging program here. Um, we have hundreds and hundreds of barrels. Uh, I teach, I actually teach the UCSD barrel aging pro pro class now, sorry, not program, um, but the, that real-time PCR is great for barrel testing. Um, I, I can really hone in on if there is a wild yeast in a barrel, what kind it is, um, or uh, what bacteria it, we've actually passed a, a barrel into a clean beer that is positive for lactoimpedia, but doesn't have hop resistance. Because it was a super hoppy beer, I felt comfortable, you know what, we can use that barrel I don't think it's going to go sour. It doesn't have the ability in that beer to actually go sour. And it didn't. So uh, normally we would have dumped that barrel, um, which is a lot of money. Uh, but I felt comfortable using it. So real-time PCR has been really cool. And I'll show you that. So you can see the laminar flow hood. Um, that's kind of my clean space. It's a mess now. I thought of cleaning up for you guys, but now you're seeing a quality lab, how it runs, um, but there's the, the machine there. Very small footprint. And again, the SOPs are getting better and better, uh, more user-friendly. Yeah, like uh, we also use the qPCR for our quality checks to make sure there's no contaminants. Um, it's a lot higher of a 
uh, lower, sorry, lower of a detection limit. So we could identify a lot uh, more using qPCR. Um, exactly. Hopefully everyone's like familiar with uh, PCR now with uh, all the COVID testing and um, just that polymer chain, chain reaction of, of how uh, a certain like um, DNA sequence, RNA sequences just multiplied. And then from that, you could like really identify uh, what organism it is or um, uh, for real time, it's almost like a, a panel where depending on what channel um, is hit on, you could see uh, in that panel, there's a certain, like maybe there's lacto in, the, in this uh, channel one. And like, if there's a hit in channel two, it'll be something like diastatic. Uh, so like this right, real time right. just really helps um, identify um, a lot of very robust uh, multiple organisms in certain channels. Uh, Peter, have you had any like limitations with using like qPCR of, uh, it's really good to check for those qPCR PCRs of what organisms are on there. I feel like um, those kits have really evolved to include a lot of the most common brewery contaminants, but ha has there been any times where you've seen something uh, very unique, very different or? So um, it, it only really focuses on beer spoilers. So we just released um, our first ever non-alcoholic beer, which certainly beer spoilers can go after, but other things can as well. And I'm still trying to figure out how, what stuff I can test for um, without going too crazy um, in that non-alcoholic beer. Uh, it's still low pH, it's still anaerobic, um, but certainly some things can, can grow in there that I'm not testing for, or I'm trying to figure out ways to test for. For that, uh, you were doing some plating, is that correct, Peter, as well, to like try I to do catch? Have, uh, yeah, yeah, I have some liquid, um, I have a, one liquid media for bacteria and one liquid media that I make in-house for, uh, for yeast. And both are, if I want to go to PCR, both are able to go to PCR. Um, they don't have too many inhibitors in them or anything. Yeah, that, that's what's always nice is there's so many different media types out there to help like filter, um, depending on if it's like selective or uh, differential to really identify those those organisms or even with like those uh, liquid broths that you were saying there. They're good enrichments to help promote the growth of some of those organisms to help uh, when you run it through that uh, real-time PCR to identify it. Exactly. But before, uh, before we had a micro program here, we would send all our samples into White Labs. And basically that, that uh, chart that you just, that table you just showed that's what we would get back from you guys. And it would say, hey, there were no colonies found in SDA. There were two colonies found in WLD. Um, and you guys would further go into, we, we think that it's a bacillus based off of its gram stain or based off of looking at it under a microscope. It was, it was pretty powerful. Yeah. Uh, I all say it's like solving two pieces of the puzzle or like depending on what uh, micro plate it's plated on and how it grows, um, like depending on its colony formation is like a great source. Sometimes certain medias have like acid clearing. So you could really see like, oh, is this, is this gonna be a beer spoiler or not? And then uh, like you were saying of like, yeah, we from that we take those organisms, gram stain it to see if it's gram positive, gram negative and uh, look at it under the microscope to really um, identify, uh, uh, give us an educated guess on what that organism is. Is, um, just because, yeah, we do see everything and anything in the analytical lab um, where I like to say it's uh, the fermentation forensics because a lot of times we don't right. get the whole piece of the puzzle because we're not in the full process. We just get uh, the problem. So then it's a lot of communication with the customer also helping them understand the results and figuring out what it is or if they should be concerned or how to tighten up their parameters of such as like the ATP swabbing, like figure out where that contamination is occurring. Right. Um, I think we could uh, 
move on to some of your other like uh, fun instruments and new uh, cutting edge um, toys you, you've been uh, working with, like the, the Tannin uh, one you showed me uh, in your lab. Yeah, so um, there's one on loan. I don't know if I could show it. We signed an NDA, but there's, one, there's a machine on loan. It's a EPR, uh, electroparamagnetic resonance machine. Um, I don't have the budget to buy it, but this company wants to uh, have, um, like be in the brewery market, be in the craft beer market. And I saw on the ASBC and MBA that Miller Coors and some of these much, much, much bigger breweries were using this to learn about shelf life. Um, so, I mean, at, we're a craft beer brewery. Our shelf lives aren't great. They're really like, we make a lot of hoppy beers. Um, we make beer with adjuncts that fall off over time. So, so how do we increase our shelf life? Um, our deal levels are coming out of our canning line at 50. So we can't really go much lower. Um, so now I'm, I'm thinking of certain additives and there's, there's one out in the market that's a tannin based. It's actually from oak barrels. So you add hot side um, and tannin is an antioxidant. So you, you think that there's, it's pulling some oxidative, um, either oxygen itself or transition metals. Maybe it's chelating that the science they're still, the company is still doing the science, but um, I run one beer with that tannin on that EPR machine and I run one without. And the one with the tannin additive actually lasted longer. Um, so basically the, the machine oxidizes the crap out of the beer over 60 minutes. And you're looking for hopefully a little more lag before it gets oxidized, before it curves up. Um, and that means your antioxidants are doing a good job of keeping your beer stable. Um, and it, it actually happened. The slope was different. Um, it actually plateaued before. So all around like instantly, it, N equals one, if you're a stat nerd, we're only, we're actually a few experiments in, but uh, two weeks ago, we were only one in and it was immediate response. Um, which is a pretty exciting. You rarely get that in the brewing industry. You have to do experiment after experiment after experiment to gather enough data. Um, uh, so that, that was cool. We're, we're probably going to continue using that product too. Nice. Uh, just speaking of shelf life, do you guys do any other shelf life testing such as like sensory or? So we have a sensory panel every week uh, on Thursday. Um, it's five people. Uh, so never yields statistically significant results you usually need about 14 people um, to get there uh, but it does it certainly leads us down certain paths and then um, I use a software uh, called draft lab um, it a lot of breweries use it it's great um, it's a little expensive probably for some smaller breweries but um, it's it takes all the data and makes it easy for me to kind of track a beer over time and I could add little notes in like, hey, I kept this room temperature for a week, or I kept this sample cold for two months. Um, and I could kind of track what I did to that beer over time, depending on if it's in my closet or in my fridge, or um, I every now and again, put a beer out outside next to the boiler, just like worst case scenario. Sensory panel does not like that. And I giggle sometimes, but uh, <laughs> you gotta, someone's gonna leave their beer your beer in the trunk of their car and gonna taste it, gonna put it in the fridge and try it at a party or something. You're like, what's gonna happen? What's the worst case scenario? Um, so I'll, I'll track shelf life for that. I'm gonna try and uh, correlate the EPR data with some shelf life data. Um, even though Miller Coors has already kind of done that, but it, it does correlate really well. Um, I'm gonna do it myself. I just feel better that way. Um, but it, yeah, sensory is is amazing. Um, even just like it, it's powerful to get your next tool as well. So we're looking into water. We're in a drought in California. Um, I can show a beer that has regular San Diego water versus a beer that has a very soft profile. And I could show my panel, hey, this is like this is how just water can change or um, just there's some different water salts change and 
you'd be like, oh, maybe we need an RO system. <laughs> yeah, like building all the sensory programs, probably the one of the most cheapest and affordable things you could do of, um, it's right in, in front of you of like, all right, you're tasting that hard water versus soft water, or you could spike a certain sample to help them identify like off yeah, flavors. Uh, yes. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, like just always tasting your beer, knowing, making sure it's like true to brand and creating that flag of like, all right, at this certain time point of the shelf life of keeping those notes of like, hey, um, three months down the road, this beer is starting to not taste the way we want it for our brand's sake. Maybe it's time to pull it, but just starting that program, just starting to take those notes and having people taste it is probably the best, cheapest thing you could do, right? Definitely. And if, say we're doing, a, like our, I already talked about it, but like our Oktoberfest, like we do it once a year, like you want to have good notes from the last time because you definitely have forgotten it's been nine months since you last brewed it or 10 months um so having those notes to go back of like hey why did we up the carbonation or um why did we switch out that malt last time was it just a supply chain issue or was it a, was it actually a tasting thing um more notes the better like not everyone's going to have that draft lab um excel is used constantly at alesmith um it's Unfortunately, it shouldn't be a database, but we, we use it as a database sometimes. Um, and it's a, it's, I keep saying the word powerful, but all these tools are very, very powerful. Yeah, like record keeping proper SOPs of writing down as much as possible. Um, the more data you have, the better. So that way you could start creating your flags of what's your critical control point that you wanna really hone into. Um, this is what our White Labs Brew Co brew sheet looks like of, um, Nice. Luckily, we have the analytical lab of we get to monitor the DOs and um, the IBUs and how much that drops to paint, uh, for the yeast or how much uh, nitrogen the yeast needs. But we right. have like the daily fermentation kinetics. Um, we monitor uh, diastol for like dry hop. Um, I know uh, what we were talking a bit about like dry hop creep and how mm -hmm. that that causes a diastol spike. Making sure um, doing like a forced diastol test before. Um, dropping the yeast out of suspension, like really, really is another like critical control point for us. Um, you, you got, uh, Peter, you guys also do a force D, is that correct? Uh, so we, uh, right before COVID got a, a GC, that's that machine oh. there. Um, so we do GC BDK tests in-house uh, more or less every day, uh, not on every tank, uh, we do it mostly around uh, dry hot. Uh, that's what we're caring about. Um, but before that, it was forced diacetyl tests. And we learned that not only do you want to do those throughout uh, dry hot, but going into dry hot. So if you're going into dry hop and you're already, your D levels are really, really high, you're going to create like a nice double bump um, after you add your dry hops. So make sure you go in the dry hop without any diacetyl um, detected. And then that, that hop, that hop creep bump will likely go above threshold, but clean up pretty easily in a few days. Yeah, I, I totally forgot how lucky we are of having GCs to actually give us quantitative numbers. <laughs> but um, for like the ones that can't afford a gas chromatograph, um, just doing a forced diacetyl test of um, getting your beer, your fermenting beer off your yeast and just uh, heating it to a certain uh, temperature. Um, pretty much what that's going to do is just change that precursor into um, diacetyl. And then because sometimes you might taste the beer and be like, oh, there's no diacetyl in it. But through oxidation and temperature, uh, that precursor could change in the diacetyl. So always doing that um, forced diacetyl test, it's super easy. Just throw in a water bath and uh, smell it afterwards. Um, if there is diacetyl, it's a no-go. So um, heads up, here's basically our, our sample prep for a bunch of our tests. It's just filter paper in a funnel and an Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, when I got to Alesmith, our decarb method was back and forth. Uh, from glass to glass, um, which worked, but it's it's not fun, <laughs> um, especially doing that if you have like eight fermenters in a day, whereas you can set these up pretty quickly and you can do a bunch of tests after this, especially for D, you don't want any yeast in there. Um, this will usually take out a bunch of the yeast. Um, 
and it's totally reusable, not the filter paper, but the, the Erlenmeyer flask and everything. Um, I do that. So my VDK tests go through that. Our gravity checks go through that. Force diacetyl test, polyphenol tests. It, it's kind of the start of every test. Yeah. Uh, we use a lot of filter paper as well, as well as uh, we have like a, the centrifuge tube to help nice. centrifuge yeah, yeah. the yeast out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For, um, I know you were, we were talking about note-taking and how you're like contract brewing. Um, how does that like coincide with each other and um, what what problems have you ran into with, with those variables of trying to reproduce someone else's um, stuff? So uh, for contract brewing, I mean, the, we're usually really following the first few batches and often the, the um, other brewers are here from the other company um, for those so that they can see our process if they want to change anything. Um, we've had a lot of like other malts and hops in house. So I, I kind of have to monitor those and the metrics of those. Um, some of them act a little differently than our stuff, hot side or um, in the dry hop. Um, we, it's, it's a very important for the customer. They're our customer when they ask to have all the data ready to go. Um, nice and neat. Uh, we have uh, all our recipes are, a, uh, are still in Excel. So we input a lot of our data in there and um, each batch is a tab on the bottom. And then the last tab is a testing log. So all the gravity checks are in there. My VDK tests are in there. My final check for IBU and color and tannin level and all that stuff's in there. My micro test is in there. Um, it's a great way to uh, hone in on one recipe on one batch of beer and you can see all your data ready to go. Um, and then from there, if you wanna actually do some statistical analysis, grab all that, put it in a, some stat software, and then compare it to some other stuff. But it's nice to have a full log of all the parameters and all the tests that happen um, to that batch. Yeah, so bottom line is record keeping, like the more notes, key. the more notes, the <laughs> key. Um, yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. Try to help troubleshoot a problem. If there's not enough information there, it's really hard to pinpoint what the variable that caused that problem is. So the more record keeping you can uh, do, the more notes, the easier it is to help solve a problem. Exactly. Um, I think, I think uh, let's see if, I do not any believe we have questions? any questions, but, um, we were talking uh, before this of um, what's the next biggest thing you see coming down the pipeline for in terms of QAQC for the brewing world or like what's the hot trend right now or the hot science topic? Um, I mean, the last few years, it's uh, well, say last like two years, non-alcoholic is getting bigger. That's fun to see. And then um, a lot of the science on dry hop creep and how yeast affects hopping, like late addition hopping um, or post hot side hopping. Um, people are coming out with enzyme products to add in to kind of release more of the, uh, the, the hop oils. Um, and then if there's yeast still there, some biotransformation, um, all that good stuff. Like it's, it's fun that Sometimes the process comes first, like people realize like, oh, this does something, this process changes the beer. And then the science is like kind of lagging behind, but we got to figure out why, why is it doing that so that we can, we can understand it and maybe create some products around it or create some good SOPs that if you want that flavor, this is how to do it. Um, so yeah, I, I like biotransformation. Um, I like non-alcoholic beers now quite a bit. Um, and I like all the science that's coming out about it. Yeah, it's it's funny how like both go hand in hand how, of how they grow of um, like the dry hop. Like there's so many good uh, SOPs and protocols now to help like remedy certain uh, dry hop creeps or like help figure exactly. out um, 
that over attenuation that does happen sometimes with dry hop uh, creep to help uh, fight fight and remedy that problem. Uh, same with like biotransformation of like all those like looking more into like beta glucoxidase or beta lyase of those enzymatic activities and seeing how well that activity actually works in a beer. Um, I find super interesting. Same with the non-alcoholic. Non-alcoholics with not being uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae strains, they're very uh, wild yeast, so they're going to produce a lot different metabolisms or different acids. Um, I think one key thing for those non-alcoholics that um, is going to keep on growing and keep on uh, being talked about is like the pH drop of how like the pH isn't isn't dropping as much, so then there, you could harbor some uh, pathogenic organisms, so making yeah, sure baddies. you're... Yeah, making sure your mash is a bit lower or trying to help remedy, remedy those problems. I think those are all great starting conversations and great topics because what we're record keeping and seeing, hey, this isn't the way it usually works for, with a sack strain. It's, it's doing something different. Right, and it's, it's not only you want that pH drop for stability, but also you expect that in a beer. So if you, if you have something at a pH of five, it's definitely not going to take as much as something like 4.4. 4. Um, and people really want any beer to taste like beer. So um, it's great that those are go hand in hand. <laughs> um, you're able to drop the pH and it's good sensory wise. Um, but yeah, I think I saw one question. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, oh, the man. Says, where do you purchase the set of primers for QPCR for one? or several organisms for contamination analysis. Is it a set commercial kit already available or do you develop the set of primers yourself? Um, would, Audrey, would you like to I answer wish, that? Yeah, I, I wish I had the time to create my own primaries. I have that knowledge base. So I would love to, um, especially because a lot of them are, are in the literature, um, but I use a commercial kit. And what's great is they've already multiplexed so that there's, multiple channels, um, I can actually, I, ha I have it up. So my, my yeast one looks at Decara, Brett Brooks, Diastaticus, and then there's an internal control. So there are four channels um, and they've already, I mean, they've all done the studies. Um, the company has done the studies to make sure that those primers don't interact with each other and all that stuff. So I'm leaving that to them. Um, multiplexing on your, on your own is tough. I'd have to do a lot of work as a singular person. Um, but I think both of us use Invisible Sentinel, right? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Um, for us, our, our commercial kit actually was developed um, specifically for our yeast, um, like certain contaminants. So there was a bunch of R&D for uh, those set of primers, um, just because with those, that real-time PCR, it's a panel, like we were saying. So it's going to have a bunch of different primers to identify uh, various organisms. Um, there's a bunch of literature, like if you want a certain set of primers just for endpoint PCR of just identifying like a specific organism, that's like very um, easy uh, or robust, like what, well, well, uh, there's a lot of scientific knowledge behind those endpoints of like, oh, you want to order a certain primer to identify a certain organism. Um, that, that's oh, really, really, um, that information's out there and easy to find on the, on the internet. But yeah, uh, for those panels of QPCRs, uh, commercial kits, they've done the research, they've done the R&D. So those are probably the best ways to go. Yeah. And the, I mean, the main thing is, uh, another main thing is that lysis buffer. Like the kit is specific for, to do like wild yeast and saccharomyces. Like some of those cell walls could be really tough. Um, uh, bacteria, not so much, but yeast definitely. I mean, they've figured all that out. <laughs> Lots and lots of R&D. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Were Thank there, you for that uh, question, though. That was nerdy. I love that. <laughs> were there any other questions or um, anything you wanted to talk about, Peter? Um, I mean, the, the lab behind me is, is could probably be a little imposing. It's a lot of equipment, but it's built up over seven years. Don't, don't be discouraged. I, again, started with a microscope. <laughs> Uh, and a small spec. Um, and one thing I tell um, is a, an anecdote that just kind of can be very general. Um, if you don't have a micro, if you 
release a barrel aged beer and you don't have a micro arm of your lab, um, you can submit or like, it can often come down to like pH and Play-Doh. Just having the tools to, to see, hey, in the year that we've been aging this beer, has the pH dropped? No. Probably good to go. Has the Play-Doh dropped? No. It's probably good to go. If the pH drops, you probably have some lactic bacteria in there, acetic bacteria. Uh, so you probably don't want to bottle that. If the pH is dropped, likely a wild yeast or, or it went in with sugar left over and kept fermenting. Um, so a lot of beer can be kind of go down to those few things. And all the equipment that I've gotten, I've only gotten because there's a constant issue. Like the, the hot creep allowed me to get the GC. Um, but at the end of the day, the most the tests I'm doing, I'm doing with a pH meter and a, a DMA density meter. Um, I actually still don't have an alkalizer. Um, Devin knows well that I, I still sent in a bunch of samples to White Labs, especially for alcohol, for ABV, um, as well as like our nutrition facts testing, if we want to put those on a can. Um, every now and again, I validate my micro with their micro just to make sure that I'm up, my technique is working because um, I know theirs is so robust. Um, yeah, I, I send an ABV test like weekly to, to you guys. Yeah, uh, we get ABV tests all the time. Um, you could always go to the TTB website, the TTB Chemist Certification Program and see what labs are close by to uh, send in uh, testing. So like outside testing is always like a quick, easy fix. But like what Peter was saying, the bottom line is you could start a QAQC lab with nothing, just good record keeping, taking those good uh, daily fermentation kinetics, as well as like building out your sensory program. That, that's not gonna take a lot of time. You could uh, start identifying um, forced diastoles and all that like dry hop creep, like use what, what resources you already have and then start investing of like what we we're talking about, DO meters for making sure uh, you get healthy fermentations uh, upstream of like those PPM DO meters aren't uh, super expensive. Same with the ATP meter. That's a quick micro check without actually doing micro. You could really see if that CIP is working. Like there, there's uh, a lot of places to start um, early on uh, with the resources you do have without needing to get the QPCR or get, needing to get a gas chromatograph. We're, we're lucky enough that we have these instruments, but they're, they're not a necessity for um, uh, a small brewery, a small mid-sized brewery. Yeah. Start small. It can get overwhelmed. When you get a new piece of equipment, it can, can be overwhelming. You have, you have new tests and you have new experiments that you want to do. Um, so start small and just grow organically. That's the best way to do it. Totally agree. But yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining me on this uh, Wednesday webinar, Peter. Um, I think My we'll, pleasure. we covered so many fun topics. That it's always fun uh, geeking out with you. Uh, yeah, it's always science fun side. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, thank you uh, everyone for joining. Um, we'll post this video on YouTube um, and hopefully uh, send us your questions uh, and we will see you around. Thank you very much. Cheers, everyone. Take care.